Um, good, so today I'm going to be uh, sharing with you uh, the work that I do with uh, hypnosis and particularly regression hypnosis. Um, a little background of how I got here, uh, how a nice guy like me ended up in a place like this. Now I'll let you <laughs> decide that. Um, so you heard about my background with, uh, not only is my brother a psychiatrist, my two sisters are also psychiatrists. So I'm the black sheep of the family. I'm just a, a lowly social worker on the hierarchy of, uh, of insurance medical care. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I remember my father, when I picked social work, he, at first he said, you know, what a, what a horror story that you're gonna be a social worker. And then years later when managed care took over, he said, boy, you made the right choice. <laughs> the only people allowed to still talk with people and don't have to rush them in and out. But um, so my father had, uh, he would work with hypnosis. You know, he was a Freudian psychoanal uh, psychoanalyst. And so hypnosis was a little bit a part of his practice, not, not much. Um, so I had uh, heard about hypnosis. And then, uh, as you heard, I had a, a great grandmother who was a medium. And that got me interested in the unseen worlds. And I think that in this life was the spark of interest that led me to the Casey work. And so when I found out about Edgar Casey, I really found a, a place that synthesized a lot of different thoughts that I had. Like I think Edgar Casey's called the uh, father of holistic medicine. I think he's also maybe a forerunner of holistic theology. I mean, I think that his readings really talk about God. They don't really talk about religions per se. And they talk about how the founders of the religions are in some ways trying to explain God to us, help us access God, but then they become a, uh, a religion. Um, and so um, it was through Edgar Cayce that I found this rubric that, that synthesized Eastern thought and meditation with uh, my Western kind of spiritual upbringing. So that, that was really what brought me first to Edgar Cayce. And then I joined a Search for God group in uh, Boston and then just started falling in love with the organization and would come down here for events like this, conferences, and then eventually I decided to uh, move here. Now I think my career has, uh, I think the success of my career has been really that I've made use of opportunities. I've just kind of followed the, the open doors that uh, come in my path. So when I moved here to Virginia Beach, my ego self, I had a background in administration and I thought that that would be the best use of my skills here. But the administrative doors were all closed and there was uh, the, the job opening at the time was for conference facilitator. So uh, what Gary just did is what I did for four years. I was present, back then I was day and night, there wasn't a backup facilitator. It was 24-7 it was uh, in that job. And so back then there were like two a month. So I think in those four years I attended about 100 uh, conferences and I attended all of them, not just, not just the Anita Murjani's people like me I would come and uh, and listen to, and they were, and they were. Uh, it was quite an education. I think of it as my metaphysical PhD, just kind of learning all these different uh, ideas. And um, but what ARE did back then, I get they still do it, but they would have an annual uh, past life regression class, and so I uh, facilitated that for four years, and eventually got certified through uh, Alan Chips's uh, group, and then I started doing uh, regressions. And I'd have to say that at the beginning of my work, uh, it was purely past life regression, meaning that people would go into a trance state and they'd open a door and they would access a past life memory. So I'd say for about four or five years, that was what would happen. And then I remember on a trip to Detroit, when I stayed after a conference, people started to have other kinds of experiences. I was giving the same suggestions, but other experiences came through. And now, I don't know how many years later, that this, I've changed the name really. It, it, it's still known to the public as past life regression, but I refer to it now as soul contact. I think what happens is that you move through the veil of this life consciousness and you move into higher levels of, uh, of yourself. Kind of like Anita was talking about yesterday with the, the iceberg. You kind of go more into your uh, fourth dimensional, fifth dimensional, all the way to the infinite dimensional self. And there you can access a lot of different types of uh, experiences. So you can have past life experiences. Sometimes people go into what are called future life projections, kind of experience what the future, their future might look like or the future of the world might look like. Uh, people also contact their guides. 
So apparently before we're born, we have a group of a council that works with us unconsciously. Kind of when we go to sleep, we work with our guides. We remember what our pre-life plan was and all that sort of thing. And then sometimes people can also have mediumistic experiences. They contact the deceased, even their pets. They're all there waiting for you on the other side. And so you, uh, you can have uh, contact, uh, especially it seems that uh, shortly after someone uh, parts, someone, shortly after someone crosses to the other side, they're much more easy to uh, access. And then sometimes people have dreamlike experiences. And so um, I would say that, um, you know, it, it's a real gift to be a psychotherapist. You know, my parents were psychotherapists or psychiatrists, and I followed in that tradition of being a psychotherapist. And it's a real privilege as a psychotherapist because you get to talk with people about things that they don't normally talk about. You get to get behind their veil. You know, you get into their deeper self. And it's just a privilege to hear about people's life experiences and their struggles and kind of what they're, what they're trying to become. But I think that also now being a regressionist, it's, it's that even more. Uh, you know, I've, it was, I did two regressions yesterday, one today, and I've probably done about 5,000 of those. And I've become a real um, student of the soul, a real student of what it's like to be here on earth, and then what the other dimensions are about, and how they are uh, resources for us while we're here in the earth. And we, we come into each life with a kind of amnesia. And so um, it sometimes, you heard uh, yesterday from Cheryl, children can more easily remember their past lives, but there comes a point where we kind of become encased in this experience and those memories uh, withdraw to the subconscious uh, mind. And so I've had the privilege of just witnessing uh, people's uh, past lives where they have had, you know, I, I haven't met anybody famous really in a past life, but certainly uh, famous periods of history. I remember working with a woman who worked at the Library of Alexandria when it burned. And she, uh, in this life, she unconsciously mistrusted books. And so she was part of putting all of uh, literature on uh, computers because unconsciously said that's the way they can be saved with having them in a physical form, they can be destroyed. So it was just interesting to, to as she was watching the, the, the library burn down, it was quite a, a horrible tragedy for her in that life. She was a librarian there, working there. So that's certainly been a part of uh, witnessing history from the individual perspective. And then also having experiences with guides and masters on the other side, and as they teach and as they try to enlighten uh, individuals about the purpose and meanings of life, why you're here. A little bit like uh, Anita, Anita's story yesterday um, is, is a, sort of what happens in a regression. You, you know, of course, when it's a near-death experience, it's kind of very profoundly, you, know, you, you might spend days in that uh, altered state of consciousness, whereas in a regression, it's just a few hours. But the, what she downloaded from that experience is, is not uncommon. I think that it's available to all of us. You know, it's like I, I could easily say for 1995, you can have a session with me or something like that. But what I want to tell you is that you don't have to do that. You know, it's like sometimes a session is a catalyst. It kind of helps you open this door. But one of the things Edgar Cayce talks about the times that we're living in is that the veil is very thin. And then people like myself, I would say we're like uh, initiators. We're helping initiate people into the mysteries of their own self, how you can access through trance. You know, trance is basically like a type of meditation. So we'll be doing some exercises today where I'll invite you to, uh, to do this, to, you know, let's say uh, it was said that Jesus dared to call himself one with God or a child of God. And I'll dare to say that each one of you can access your soul self. Each one of you can access your divinity. It's that, that mystical uh, quality. We all have direct access to God. And so a, a regression is a formal process of doing that. But once that door is open, you can learn how to access those altered states of consciousness and all the gifts and abilities that are there. Sometimes I look at scripture or different scriptures and look at how these altered states are described. For example, when Jesus says, I come that you have not just life, but you have life more abundantly and I, that you drink of the water of life. Oftentimes I think that when we reach behind the veil 
and we tap into that source. You know, the, the word source means uh, uh, like a well. And so you can tap into that, and that's a, uh, a source of renewal and renovation that's available, again, uh, to all of us. So, so my last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, I've just been a student of, of soul, of soul uh, in, in action in, in our lives. Now, um, you may be surprised, you know, if, if Gary's listening, I'll tell him something maybe he doesn't know about me. But when I was a teenager, I wanted to be a shaman. You know, I read all of Carlos Castaneda's books, and I loved Don Juan, you know? I wanted to be Carlos Castaneda, and I wanted to be with Don Juan. I didn't necessarily want to do all the drugs, <laughs> but I wanted to experience these, um, these interesting uh, realities and states of consciousness that he had. And so I talked to my father about it, and my father was very open-minded. And so at a conference, he met a uh, Native American shaman. And so he introduced him to me, and I told, I spoke with the man, I said, oh, I'd like to be a student of yours. And he said, no, no, stay, stay in your tradition. And I said, okay. And <laughs> what I later found out is I failed the first test. That they, if you want to be a student of a shaman, they rebuff you, they test you. And so I failed that test. And so I, I said, oh, okay, I got to stay in my tradition. I got to follow the wise words. And he was probably like, well, that was easy, this kid. <laughs> But I think over time, again, following the opportunities, I think that the work that I do is shamanic. And I define shamanic meaning that you work between the worlds. You know, a psychiatrist, if you work between the conscious and the unconscious world, and I think I work between the, uh, the conscious level that we're in now and the soul uh, consciousness that we're trying to manifest and channel uh, into this life. Good, so that's, uh, let's bring down the, the uh, I have a PowerPoint uh, that will just help me uh, as a reference uh, point here. I think it's also wonderful that the, uh, the ARE has gotten into doing an annual afterlife. I know there's a, there was another group that was doing one that was very successful, and I think that if there's one thing that Edgar, uh, you know, Edgar Casey, the ARE, is about, it's about understanding the soul. And I think that um, also, as you know, Edgar Casey his readings came while in a trance state. So he was under hypnosis. So all of these, all of his material were in that altered state. And so I think that hypnosis is very, uh, you know, syntonic or in sync with what Edgar Cayce talked about. And he certainly gave a lot of readings about hypnosis. And uh, I think what, you know, there's lots of ways to define hypnosis. I think hypnosis taps into the flexibility that we have through the mind that we don't think we have, that we think there's so much that we think is fixed. And hypnosis, in a way, kind of works with the underlying matrix of what's going on physically in your life. And it's really the, like, your mind is kind of the projector. And in life, we're working with the, the screen. And through hypnosis, you can tinker with the projector, and it alters what you see on the, uh, on the screen. So here's the, here's the title of this conference. Soul Contact is the name of the work that I do. It's a, I've evolved it from past life regression. But I thought there was an alternative title. Near, well, near-death experience help, I don't recommend it. Yeah. They're really wonderful, but I hear sometimes people don't quite make it back. You know, you only hear the stories where they, you know, they're always, it's always a story where they say, you've got to go back. And then they say, oh, okay. Well, there's plenty of them. So you have to go back. Uh-uh, I'm done. <laughs> so, yeah, and those ones, we don't hear those stories. <laughs> So this, of course, is probably the trademark reading of Edgar Cayce. Spirit is the life, mind is the builder, and the physical is the result. It's right in the lobby. So I think that's, uh, I think we take it for granted now, but I think in Cayce's time, that was quite uh, radical. You know, the, the body was seen as its own separate self. There was no thought that, uh, that our thoughts affect our body. You know, even some places in medicine now, it's still not thought of that. You know, but now we have plenty of mind, body, uh, clinics and understanding of the influence. Bless you. And so with this reading, what I take it to mean is that, that spirit, again, being the life, spirit, I would say, is also the cause. So spirit is our source, and mind is a way that we channel, kind of bring spirit into manifestation. And then the mind that's connected spiritually can then create in the physical things that are life-giving and things that are healthy, whatever word you want to use. But I think the, the root of illness is when we disconnect spiritually. 
And the, the mind is hungry. The mind has to feed on something. That's why Casey said we have to feed the mind an ideal. You know, it's got, it's got to eat something. And if you're not purposefully, consciously feeding it something, it's going to feed on, eventually, on something else. And if it's not connected spiritually, it's going to feed on things that are material and materialistic. And then that becomes its own problem. You know, I think that um, having a material ideal uh, becomes uh, problematic because I think that, let's say, a material ideal, I remember reading, uh, I'll save names, but a billionaire said, life is a game and money is how you keep score. And so that becomes the acquisition of things becomes the ideal. And that, that has, that, that's a, a finite ideal. It's not, it's not a life-giving ideal. And so I think that eventually what happens if you don't have a spiritual connection, the physical starts to become diseased. It starts to become ill. And that's why so much now you're hearing about how people get well from terminal illness. They change not just physically, they change mentally and spiritually. So I think with, uh, last night I was here listening to Anita, and so she had a perfectly nice life. You know, her, her death, or her, her near-death experience came from a place of, she had a lot of fears, and she had a lot of doubts, and that manifested. You know, she was talking about how she was fearing cancer, and in some way creating cancer through the fear of it. And so she eventually realized that that fear needed to get worked on. And so she connected spiritually because basically what the physical body believes that the, is that there is death. And the spiritual body realizes there is no death. And most of our, our problems here on earth come from this fear, mostly fear of death, that we're, we're all trying to, to protect ourselves. And even in that fear of, of wanting to protect ourselves becomes the seed of illness in and of itself. So in this reading, I take that the, to, to heal. You know, you don't have to wait till you're ill, but if you spiritually connect, your mind is going to become much more constructive and your body is going to become a vehicle of that uh, in itself. And so I think like practices like meditation, practices like regression, spiritual regressions, they take you to that place. And I think a, a near-death experience is kind of like getting catapulted into that. Again, I don't recommend those. They're very, very helpful. Now, as I've come, uh, one of the things that's, you, you have the best opportunity to learn about something when you're forced to teach it. And so, um, I remember Alan Chips, who was a teacher here, he passed away from cancer. He had lymphoma. And so I took over, I was thrown in to teaching the class as his, uh, you know, as the next uh, man up for for, uh, for the course. And so as I, I had done a lot of regressions, but there's a difference between, you know, you tend to do things and then when you're gonna teach it, you have to think about why you do those because there's choice points all the time. And so I started not only conducting regressions, but I started thinking about the different choice points so I could start to understand what I was doing and if that was the best thing to do, if there were other alternatives. But one of the things I've learned over my practice is that the psyche naturally wants to heal itself. By psyche, I mean your soul, so the, the soul self. It, if, if you, it's almost like if you cut your hand, there's natural processes that want to heal that up. The blood starts to coagulate, forms a scab. If you pick at it and you don't you know, put, if it's not antiseptic, it'll get infected, but the body is trying constantly to heal itself. And I think it's the same with our psychic self, our psyche. So that what I find with regression hypnosis, is that at the beginning of a practice, I used to become much, be much more directive. I felt that I had to orchestrate the process. And over time, I realized that it would be most helpful if I sort of got out of the way. That in a way, like a shaman, I'm taking people, you know, my job is to take people to these places and then not get in the way, facilitate a process, and then bring people back. So sometimes I call myself a Sherpa. I take people <laughs> to Mount Everest, I'm not, if it's, if it's cold and, and, and snowy, you can't see anything, I can't control the weather. I just, I'm just going to get you there and I get you back. That's, the, that's what you've paid. That's your ticket, your admission ticket. But if, the per, if there's, uh, you know, beyond me, if that uh, person has these different psychic you know, soul attributes working, there will be natural healing processes. Now, I'm going to tell you, this story again later, but I just think now is a good time to bring it up. 
early on in my practice, a man under trance, he, he came to me because he had chronic laryngitis. And so he had heard that Edgar Cayce had chronic laryngitis and had used hypnosis to help him with that. So he had been to all the doctors just like Edgar Cayce and there was no physical cause for his laryngitis. So he thought that he'd try hypnosis. So he went under trance pretty easily and right away, I think it might have been at the first door he opened, he saw a man with a spear, right? Now, early on, I thought, man with spear, bad. <laughs> Let's go to door number two and find rainbows and unicorns, right? Because he's not paying for a man with a spear. <laughs> Opens the second door, man with a spear. Well, again, I was not the brightest regressionist. I said, let's go to the third door. It's got to be the rainbows and the unicorns. Third door, man with the spear. So that's what I mean. The psyche wanted him to deal with that. I was the problem. His psyche, I could have taken him to 12 doors until I got it, that he had to deal with that. So I didn't know what to do. But you're in this, you know, the, the soul knows what to do. So I just said, why don't you sit down and just... Imagine there's a bench there. Sit down and contemplate what you're facing. So he did for a minute or two, and he says, I completely get it now. In a past life, this man speared me, killed me. He speared me in the throat, and I died with hate and fear and anger. And he says, that's lodged in cellularly into my throat. It's at the interface of my soul and my body. He says, I understand now. What I've been shown is, is all the previous lives that led to that situation and then how it resolved. It was actually a helpful thing. That was something I needed to face. And so he said, I need to go back and re-experience that death consciously. I have to experience it in love, not in this angry state. And so I said, okay, go ahead. And he went and re-experienced his death in a, in a much more higher consciousness. And once it was over, he said, okay, it's, it's done. I'm, I'm never going to have this laryngitis again. And so he stayed in touch with me and he's never uh, confronted that. It's been, it was erased. Now that's interesting. We'll talk a little bit about what Casey calls the Akashic Records. And so Casey says the Akashic Records is the way that time is recorded. So he, you know, a past life, uh, he, when Casey would give you a past life reading, he would access something called the Akashic Records. Akasha means, is a Sanskrit word that means ether. And so that every moment, Casey said, is recorded on this kind of film. And so he, you know, all of us, when you do a reading, you access the Akashic record uh, in a way. And so he was accessing his own personal Akashic record, but he was also able to interact with it. He was also able to have something from the past was influencing him now, and he was able to go back and, and you know, rewrite something. So that's where I talk about the fluidity, that you might think, well, my past life is fixed. I can't change anything that's ever, that, that's, that's the, the, the Akashic record is, is it written in stone? It isn't. It's written in a film. So he was able to somehow alter that experience. Very interesting, isn't it? You know, that Anita was talking about how all time is one. Certainly Edgar Cayce says that. And when you, when you try to wrap your head around, like, there's no such thing as a future life or a past life. They're all one. Well, at least this gave me a glimpse of how you can interact with future, past, and present. So he was able to go into what we would think is the past activate it and alter something. So it makes me think like, right now, am I in the Akashic record? You know, is this recorded? Am I coming back because I gave an awful talk and I'm correcting it now? <laughs> 20 lifetimes in the future, I felt so embarrassed about this talk. No, no. <laughs> Who knows? So this is, a, this is what I've noticed. The psyche naturally wants to heal itself. And the regressionist job is to take people to these processes and try to let them unfold. In a way, you know, when I, to be honest with you, coming from a background as a psychotherapist and then moving into regression, at first I didn't really like regressions. You know, when somebody would come to see me and they'd say, well, I'd like a regression, I'd be like, oh God. And I'm like, <laughs> why? They're so helpful. Why is it that I, I don't want to do that? And I realized that when I'm doing talk psychotherapy, it's all me. Yeah. It's my it's my mind, it's all my experience, it's choosing the right words, and then the person's grateful to me because it has been me, me, me working. When I do a regression, I'm like, okay, yeah, take a deep breath, notice it's coming to you. It's really, it, I can't own the experience, but you know what, I can't own the success, but I can't own whatever happens in that process. I really just take people to places and then bring them back. So it's a very egoless uh, kind of work. And when I teach it, that's how I teach it, that it's like um, 
you're just there to facilitate natural processes and you're best if you get out of the way. It's a little bit like a midwife. You know, I've never met a midwife who said, I birthed a healthy child today, that's all me. No, that was a natural process that the midwife has to have some skill in delivering a baby, but you don't create the baby. The baby's already there. So I'm just going to go over some uh, fundamental premises of this work, some of kind of what um, is the background to it. So there has to be a belief that this physical self and this physical life are not all of you. So to do a regression, you, could, you couldn't do it and think that you're, like Carl Jung did this work and he knew that he was living in a time where people didn't believe in reincarnation and those sort of things. So he just called it active imagination. So people might remember past lives and they would just think they're making stuff up, but they would have a lot of emotional response to it, like a dream, and it would be helpful. So I guess that first point isn't really true. <laughs> but it is in a way that if you believe that you have a soul self, that certainly there's the, uh, less of a hurdle. The benefit of Carl Jung's way of approaching it is that you don't have to get into this belief of so if something's real or not. A lot of people get caught up in is what I'm experiencing real or not real. And I just think that, it, don't worry, phones ring when I'm speaking truth. So it's just, you know, it's just the <laughs> affirmation of, of what I'm saying. And so uh, I try to get out of this thing of whether what someone's experiencing is real or not because I think reality is overrated. Is this real right now? Well, every religious tradition says this is an illusion, right? Well, what about when you dream? That seems real when you're having the dream, but then you wake up, it's not real anymore. And before you were born, you were in your soul self. That was real too, right? So I just think reality is almost like a radio dial. There's different frequencies, and all of those stations have their own reality. It just depends where the, the needle is pointing. And so I think that um, what I look for from an experience is, is it healthy, is it helpful? So when somebody has a dreamlike experience, it can be very helpful. It can help a person wake up to certain aspects of themselves or those sorts of things. And that we have an eternal part of ourselves. We could call it soul. You know, as a, I grew up Catholic, and part of the teachings was that I, that I had an afterlife, that when my physical body died, my soul would go on. Um, maybe to hell or, you know, <laughs> who knows where it would go. But there was never talk, and I never thought about well, if I have an eternal soul, what's it doing before I'm born? Is it just waiting? We have one turn, this video game of life, we get one shot at it. Or uh, if I never, I, I would have loved to have asked one of the nuns and priests that question. <laughs> yeah. To a varying degree, you have a kind of a amnesia of your previous experiences before this life. Sometimes people wonder, why, do we, why don't we remember our past lives? Um, I think we remember them probably in the most important way because we remember them subconsciously. Like Casey calls karma soul memory. So the way that you go about your life, you're subconsciously reacting to people, places, and things because of past life influences. I think the fact that you don't consciously remember it is actually helpful because I think one of the, one of the things that happens in a, in a constructive regression experience is that you, in a way, you let go of the old story. You know, I think most of us, our lives are, they're dictated upon experiences that we've had. So we hold on to old stories. And I think when you reincarnate or when you have a regression experience, you can keep what you've learned. You can keep the, the consciousness of the experience and let the, 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 maybe the painful experience go. Because every, every experience we have teaches us something, in a way. And some of them are hard lessons, but a hard lesson might teach you, let's say, patience, or it might teach you humility, or it might teach you compassion. And what I encourage folks to do, and what can happen in a, in a regression, is that you keep the state of consciousness, and in some ways you forget about the story, because the story is heavy. You know, it's like I think about, uh, you know, no, no, nobody wants to suffer, right? Anybody want to suffer? No. But why do you go to, like, why do you go to school? Some of you might have a PhD in astrophysics. I assume that was not easy, but you did it because you wanted to accomplish something. So you put yourself through an experience that afterwards you would gain from and make your future easier, but you went through something difficult that you yourself chose to do. But usually when you graduate from your program, you have the, the diploma and that's what you remember. Yay, I finished. You don't think about Oh, you know, I remember in my second year with that one teacher and I flunked this test. You know, we don't dwell upon those difficult things. You just kind of celebrate. A little bit, I think Jesus meant that when he said, when a woman gives birth, it's painful. 
in the birth process, but afterwards they forget about it and they enjoy the child. And I think that's some of what I think, bless you, we have in a regression experience. You can enjoy the child that you've given birth to and you can let go of the painful memory. So I think a lot of what is going on with us in, in consciousness is that we're holding on to some old story that uh, isn't really serving us. And I think a regression is one of the ways that you can let that story go. And then the, the other is that it is possible to access this infinite part of you. You know, I remember when Neil Donald Walsh wrote the book Conversations with God, I remember feeling like, how dare he? Who does he think he is having a conversation <laughs> with God? But I, the title, you know, I realized later the title was, I'm the only one who can have a conversation with God. That would have been offensive. No, he said conversation with God. He invited all of us to the possibility of having a conversation with God. Later on, I realized Casey said the same thing. He said that this new age, we're coming into a time where we're going to be more and more God connected. That it's not, we're not going to have to rely on other people to tell us about God. We're going to get our own uh, access to God. So the, the forerunners have kind of done it for us, but they've been models. And now the, the new age is that we're able to, uh, to do that ourselves. I don't think the churches are going to like that. It's not going to be good for business <laughs> if everybody has their own access to God. And the belief that pr our previous experiences both previous lives and also Casey talked about not just lives, there's other experiences that influence, influence us in this life, and that hypnosis is a technique to access soul contact. And that, you know, oftentimes I'll say that most of what Casey said, you will have heard before. What, what Casey's genius is the synthesis of different traditions, but there are certainly some things that Casey brings to the table that aren't. Uh, in other traditions. He calls karma soul memory. I think that's a very interesting way of looking at karma. I would just add that it's unconscious soul memory. And but basically what it means is that when we meet, let's say, in, in our families, that you, know, you always wonder, why do I get along so well with my sister? And then I don't get along with my brother, but my brother gets along just fine with my sister and doesn't get along with this. You know, you wonder why are all these things? They're, most of us are operating off of an unconscious soul memory that is behind what we like and what we reject. And it happens when you, when you meet people. You'll meet people and you have this affinity towards someone and sometimes you have less than that. And sometimes maybe they remind you of somebody and that's different. And sometimes just on a on an unconscious kind of vibra vibratory level, you recognize immediately an affinity or a kind of movement away from somebody. And Casey would say, that's your soul memory. And then he says, what you do about it is what matters. The people that you don't like, do you just not keep not liking them? Or do you feel like, okay, this is the work that I have to do? So this is, uh, Anita used the iceberg metaphor yesterday, and I think it's just a good one. I think that you know, our soul self is beneath this veil of consciousness. This part here, you know, this is a three-dimensional reality above the surface. And then there's the fourth, fifth, all the way to the infinite reality. You see, I think that the way that this happened at the beginning is that as we came into this earth, we were curious about this physical world. But this physical world is three-dimensional. And we are infinite dimensional. You know, we're one with our source. We have individuality, but we're infinite in consciousness. And there was a curiosity about you know, playing in this aquarium. And so we started playing in this aquarium, but what happens is that when you, when you try to bring infinite consciousness into three-dimensional reality, it doesn't all fit. You can't bring all of that. And so we had to put stuff into storage. And the storage is the subconscious mind. And so that's where here, there's a lot of folks that think this is all they are, and then when you start doing meditation and other practices, you start tapping into this deeper self. You know, dreams come from this level. So there's different ways that the subconscious or the soul consciousness is trying to uh, break into consciousness. And I think that's what all of us are doing. We're trying to, in some ways, expand the consciousness here. You know, Edgar Cayce used to, when he'd give a reading, he would say, to sometimes he would say, ah, oh, a fourth dimensional mind. You know, most people are three-dimensional, you know, concrete. Fourth dimensional is the, is the realm of ideas. So if you like ideas, that's already fourth dimensional uh, reality. And so he would, he would give a reading, he would say, okay, this is somebody that I can talk to about ideas and they're going to understand. And so that's already, if you're into that, you're already going into the fourth dimension. 
So I mentioned earlier, our soul memory is recorded in something called the Akashic Record. Now, Akasha, like I said, it's Sanskrit for ether. If you Google Akashic Records, there's now, I don't know, tens of millions of hits for that. Nobody really believes that Casey was the first one who put that out there. I also think that Casey calls the new age, he says it's gonna be called the age of the lily. So start Googling age of the lily and start seeing, I think in 10, 20 years, there'll be thousands or millions of hits and no people won't realize that he, uh, he coined that term for it. But you know, it's, it's, what's nice about Casey's stuff is it's published, you know, we can say when this stuff was out there and how it is a, it was ahead of its time. And then the Akashic records aren't fixed in the way that we would have thought, like that example I gave you, that somehow our past, present, and future, whatever, whatever our soul reality, it's much more fluid than we would think. We're not, we're not stuck with a way of being, that there's a, there's a real possibility to alter ourselves uh, constructively. We can, of course, alter ourselves destructively. I think that, that illness, meaning that when you disconnect spiritually, you're altering your reality negatively, destructively but you can also alter your reality constructively. And I think that's where the foundation of Casey's work with ideals is that if you'll work with ideals, you're gonna be constructively influencing uh, in your life in, in all sorts of ways. Our earthly reality is much more fluid than had been previously believed. Now let me give you a little side story about just <coughs> my, my, my education in hypnosis because um, I studied past life regression through ARE and through Brian Weiss's training and others. But I also, because I'm a, a clinical social worker, you have to maintain your license through continuing education. So I decided to focus on hypnosis for a couple of years and just do continuing education, meet my, my requirements through studying hypnosis. And there's a very well-known hypnotherapist. I think he's probably the best known. He's retired now, but his name is Daniel Brown and he works uh, in Massachusetts. He's written 14 books on, on hypnosis, clinical hypnosis. I could, you know, he's on the faculty of Harvard, I'll do all the blah, blah, blah. He's just very well respected. And in one of his courses that I took, he talked about his work with people that have attachment disorders. So he had decided to try to use hypnosis with people with attachment disorders. Attachment disorder is someone, let's say, who's raised in an orphanage and, and hasn't had uh, bonding with people. And so that when they, when they grow up, you know, they can function just fine, they can work, but they don't understand how to be close to people because they haven't had, you know, in childhood you wire in all of those, uh, you know, how, how, to, how to be intimate, how to, how to connect with people, eye contact, all the things that are required. Most of us, since we had bonding with our parents or a caregiver, we naturally know how to bond. It's unconscious, but some folks didn't have that. And so they're very, very lonely because they, they go on a date and the person just experiences them as very detached. And, and they are, they don't know how to connect. And so they, you know, they, they may look off somewhere while a person's telling a very intimate story. They just don't have this wiring. So Daniel Brown had uh, a significant number of clients that were being referred to him with this disorder. And so he wanted to try uh, hypnosis. So he created a technique where he would meet with the individual. They had to be committed three or four times, uh, three to five times a week, and it took about three years. And what he did is he took them through an entire childhood experience, hypnotically imagining healthy parents. And since he was a, uh, you know, a, a psychologist with a background in developmental psychology, he showed that, again, the psyche naturally wants to heal itself. These people would go through all the stages of development that a healthy child goes through with their parents. Even reproachment, which means that you're kind of close to your parents and then you go away and then you look back. That's a very healthy bonding. If the parents aren't there, they're looking off. The, the child doesn't develop a sense of security. He found that that's what the, these people were doing in hypnosis. They were, they were wiring in healthy uh, experiences. And after three years, they were able to form healthy relationships. And that's, that's amazing. You know, it's like, what to me though, is it shows how plastic our, our experiences are, that we, we can override, we can have, in this life, you can have an experience that you can override. You see, as I listened to his, he would play recordings of the sessions so that we'd understand what was going on. As I listened to them, sometimes it sounded like somebody was downloading a past life experience with healthy parents. 
that they were then attaching to and overriding this life, and they were operating off of a healthier paradigm uh, than what came up in this life. It's amazing, isn't that? That's kind of like, we, we would think that you, it, whatever happens to you in this life, that's the whole life you have to live, and that's not true. You can, you can alter these, uh, this sort of thing. Now this is, um, Casey talks about how there's karmic issues that are more fixed. And so let's say if somebody is born blind, for example, that would most likely be a karmic situation, meaning that they have to learn in that life from blindness. And so hypnosis wouldn't necessarily be so helpful for them healing the blindness. They may be able to understand their pre-life choice about why they picked blindness. They may understand lots of the context that that is, and it might be very helpful for them in not being resentful about being blind and maybe being more seeing it as a, uh, an opportunity. So uh, I always think it's interesting to try hypnosis with a condition, but um, you know, I'm not at the place yet. I've, I've, there's a temptation sometimes when you get well known with something. People have come to me with cancer and wanted me to heal them of cancer with hypnosis. And I, I just get a little, you know, I still have a license and I, I don't want to practice medicine without a license. So I, I'll tell people that I can, you know, I can, if there's uh, symptoms or if there's psychological elements, if there's, you know, if they're not being hopeful about something, like I've certainly worked with people that are receiving chemotherapy and uh, they have much, you know, I haven't done a study of it, but they have significantly lower negative side effects using hypnosis. They play the tapes while they're receiving the, the chemo. And it's just, what, what I mostly focus on is that the body receive the chemo as medicine and not reject it as poison. And so the folks, you know, then they, they, they talk to their, their doctors and the doctors don't want anything to do with it. They just think it's, you know, voodoo. Or I think they just think it's bad for business and so they, they blow <laughs> up. But I think that that's an example of how someone with cancer can benefit from, uh, from using uh, hypnosis. Now, as, as uh, Gary was joking about earlier, he said, oh, Peter would be a good fellow to work with. And what he was implying is that my subconscious mind might be a good one to connect with. And so you do want to, when you're working with a regressionist, you do want to um, feel them out. You know, you want to intuitively sense because it's a little bit like your subconscious mind and their subconscious mind are going to interact. And so you want to feel comfortable and a lot of times when somebody first comes to a session, they do a lot of talking. And I know that it's not, they're almost stalling. They're, they're waiting to get a scan of my subconscious. And I just, I'm perfectly happy with that because I know that if they don't do that, the session's not going to work. That if I rush, okay, oh, come on, we got, we got to get down, we got to get to work, that's going to uh, ruffle the feathers. It's not going to uh, be as helpful. Sometimes I might point out, <laughs> did you want to do a talk session or do you want to do, and then, then they usually, want to proceed towards a session. I remember one woman came in and she was very anxious. You have to understand that when I'm on the road, I work out of a hotel room. And I think that, you know, meeting a man in a hotel room, <laughs> I'm in room 508, see ya, see ya later. <laughs> I don't give them a room key or anything like that. But, you know, I can understand that, that, that the paradigm is a bit unusual. And so if a woman comes in to meet with me, um, I understand they may want to feel it out for a while just to get a feeling of, of safety. And so I remember one woman was very anxious and we were just talking. And then at some point she, she relaxed and she said, okay, I feel ready to start. And then we had a wonderful session. And then when we were doing the review, I said, you know, I noticed that first you were a little anxious and it just seemed to, to change. What, what shifted? She said, oh, I saw the man with the robe that you work with and I felt comfortable immediately. And you know, the, the guy that travels with me, I didn't know he was running around in a robe in the back. No, no. <laughs> it was a guide or something. You know, I, I, I sometimes sense that, but she was able to perceive that, and that gave her a sense of confidence to, to do the, uh, the session. Now, now, sometimes, again, with, with thinking and teaching, you know, we, we hear a lot about the new age, right? Well, that implies that there was an old age, right? There's a, there's a new age, you gotta be an old age. And what's the difference? What's going on? What's the new age about and what was the old age about? Well, I think there's lots of ways you can look at it. But I think that uh, in the old age, like even Jesus, I think, was part of the old age. And Edgar Cayce, what do I mean by that? Meaning that I think that in the previous age, the old age, the healer was outside of you. So you would go to Jesus. You could show up blind. You could show up dead. You just, you just had to show up. 
And Jesus, kaboom, you know, shazam, and you would come back to life. So you didn't have to do a lot. I mean, I guess they say most of life is showing up. When Jesus is around, all you had to do was show up. And he did the heavy lifting for you. But I think that Jesus realized that there was a problem there. You know, it's kind of like healing welfare. You kind of keep giving, they're gonna, you know, he wanted to teach people how to fish. So he was doing a lot of teaching about soul consciousness, realizing that these children weren't yet able to do it, but he was planting the seeds for it. And then I think that, you know, you know what was true then is true now, is that you do have to give a dog and pony show to, for people to show up. So I think sometimes <laughs> the healing was what drew the people. You know, I can just see like you know, Jesus saying, you know, it's love, you know, it's, you have to access God and people, Heal, heal someone, heal, heal, you know, and he's like, okay, okay, bring up, you know, he'd heal somebody, and then they'd be amazed, and then he'd talk a little while, heal, heal, and he'd heal someone, and he's probably like going, oh my God. <laughs> so I think that, that that's the old age, and I think Jesus knew that, and he was trying to birth this kind of self-contact with God. You know, he, he, he gave all these clues. He said, it's not me. I'm not doing anything. In and of myself, I can do nothing. It's God through me that's doing it. Why do you thank me? It's God through me. And I think he's implying. And what did he say when somebody was well? He said, your faith made you well. I didn't make you well. It's your faith that makes you, uh, make you well. So I think that those are clues that in the new age, we're trying to grow in faith and in our direct access. Now, now, come, now along comes Edgar Cayce. I still think he's part of the old age, meaning that he didn't quite heal you. Edgar Casey never healed somebody, but he gave you the prescription. You had to do some work. You had to get some high colonics. You, know, you, had, to, you had to do some stuff to get yourself healthy. But you were still being given the instruction manual. And I think now in the new age, that, that is finished. Meaning I think that now we're, we're drawn to learning how to do that ourselves. That we can be our own Jesus, our own Buddha, be our own Edgar Casey, that we can access those uh, resources um, ourselves. And I think that the, the work that I do, as much as still somebody is coming to me, like the only time I've ever had a request for a refund for a session, a refund, <laughs> well, the, the woman thought that I was gonna give her the reading. You know, she, I, and she was like, well, this isn't what I expected. And I said, what did you expect? She said, I thought you were gonna give me the reading. I said, no, 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 it's your, you're, oh, well, I'm not, I didn't get anything, I'm, you know. So she got the money back, it was just a, a misunderstanding. But that's the whole purpose of my work, is I don't give you a reading, I help you access your own inner truth. And then my hope is that I give a lot of post-hypnotic suggestions. You see, you know, every, every profession has its business aspect, and has things that are good for business and bad for business. Most hypnotists or hypnotherapists, they don't give you too many post-hypnotic suggestions because then they're out of work. If you tell people you can do this yourself, you know, you, you have to make your living by people coming regularly. If one session cures, that's, you, know, you better charge a lot of money <laughs> because you're gonna be out of work pretty soon. Um, but you know, I remember when I first started this work, I was saying, God, I'm glad I'm doing talk psychotherapy still because they show up every week. This, this hypnosis nonsense, they're, you know, they're one session and they're done. But I give a lot of post-hypnotic suggestion for people to continue. So my hope in a spiritual way is that I don't just give someone a fish, that they continue it. And if I ever get around to writing that book, in my mind I've written about 12 books. They're all in the etheric dimension. Last year someone came up to me and said, Peter, I really enjoyed your book. And I said, could I borrow a copy? Yeah. I, I, just get it into the, uh, into the physical. But I think what hasn't been explored yet in the, in the, hypnos in the regression field I think there's plenty of books that go into what a session is like, but what I'd like to look at is the long-term effects, meaning that looking at somebody three years later or five years after they've had a regression. Since I travel around the country and I go kind of on this three-year circuit, I've met people that have had sessions previously and they do talk about how that one session was foundational. Just recently a woman was telling me that the first time she came, she began to feel this energy between her hands. She just felt this ball of energy. And she said that has now become part of her, her treatment, her healing work. And she's continuing, she feels that she's very successful, but it was through regression that that got brought to her attention and she's used it. And so those are the, what really interests me about how, how one session can ignite something that keeps somebody going uh, forward. I, I do think that since I do teach this, I'm like, this is an awful business model. <laughs> I think for me it works because I travel a lot. 
You know, I think I've tapped out Virginia Beach. Everybody's like, ah, Peter, now I've had about two with him. I don't need any more. <laughs> and then I think that um, with the Akashic Records, I think there's personal and collective. So I think that Edgar Casey would go into a deeper state of trance to access your, you know, he would, he would do the heavy lifting for you. So he had to go a greater distance to access your Akashic Record. But I think for yourself, your Akashic Record is in your own library. I mean, there may be a central library, a library of Congress, and that's where Edgar Cayce would go. But each one of you has a little library in your house. That's where your Akashic Record is. I happen to believe also that all of our memories are stored in the Akashic Record. There's a cloud out there. So you're, what you remember from childhood is in the Akashic Record. But you believe that, you remember that, so you access it. But I think that behind the veil is the Akashic Record of what happened before this life. And so I think that's part of what's a little challenging sometimes is that if I tell you, you know, remember the first time you ate popcorn, remember being at a fair or riding a pony or something like that. Most of us can remember that and we feel that's personal. I try to help people understand that's the Akashic record. When you have a past life memory, the only thing is is that you're going to be riding a little pony in ancient Egypt and you're going to be like, what the heck is this? And your ego self is going to reject it. And so there's, there's a process of kind of coming to terms with these, uh, these memories that you're coming, coming to. And so I think that in a, in a mild to moderate state of trance, you can access your personal Akashic record. And that's sometimes hard for people to realize because most people are mildly to moderately hypnotizable. And so they're aware of me, they're aware of being in the room, and there's a part of them that's like, am I really hypnotized? And then they kind of are watching a movie or they're having an experience. At the beginning, it takes a while. Like I remember my first, um, I feel like asking, you know, like Anita did, how many have heard, been, heard me before? And then she said a lot of people were new. And they said, oh good, I can use my old, same old jokes. <laughs> I'm going to have to start doing that uh, too. Um, but in my personal, uh, first time I did a regression, you know, I was, I was in this kind of in-between, I, I was aware of being in the room, and I was seeing these images. I saw a man, a blonde-haired man with a ledger writing, and he was on an old ship, like a Christopher Columbus type ship. And I'm thinking, where's this coming from? Is this a movie? Not that am I really hypnotized? What the heck is this? You know, very <laughs> incredulous. But a part of me was continued to describe, and then I said the man was the purser of the ship. This incredulous part of me had never used that word. I didn't know what it meant, but I knew that he was like the bookkeeper, the banker for the ship. So that helped me suspend my disbelief. But it helped me realize that when you're in the mild to moderate state, a part of you is not hypnotized and a part of you is. And you have to get comfortable with parts of you, that a part of you can be in an experience and another part of you is present. And so that's the mild to moderate state that most people enter. Now let me, you know, I, I, it's funny how you've come across things at different times in your career. You know, Edgar Cayce, he was doubting whether his work was going to have a future. You know, he wondered about all, giving his whole life force to readings. He wondered, will this amount to anything? And then he had a dream of the 2,200 or something like that, where he flew in a, in the, he was living on the coast of Nebraska, and he, and he flew in a cigar-shaped flying machine, and he saw that the ARE was still here. And when he woke up, ah, you know, my work has uh, validity. And so there were a lot of other questions that people had, but that was to help him kind of uh, understand the importance of his work. But you know, as I was doing this work and dedicating my life to, to regression and that sort of thing, I'm wondering, is this, you know, it helps people, but how significant is it? How important is it? Well, you know, spirit answered that question for me. I was asked to give a presentation on the book of Revelation. I'd always wanted to study it. And then Casey gave, I don't know how many, 20-some readings interpreting the book of Revelation. And there's chapter 11 where these, you know, the, the book of Revelation is just like a, a bad dream. <laughs> just like monsters with 20 heads flying out of the sky and, you know, hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes. It's just a, it's a highly symbolic, frightening book. I don't know how it made it into the uh, the Bible, they must not have understood it at all and said, oh, it'll scare people, throw it in there. That must have been the, the intention. But chapter 11 goes into these two witnesses. And let me show you the reading and how this goes. So the, the, what is meant by the two witnesses mentioned in Revelation chapter 11, section 3? Are they the mental and emotional bodies of the soul of man? That's the question. And here's his answer. This may be, interpre this may be the interpretation then. 
the mental or the subconscious, but rather is it the conscious, the, maybe everything means consciousness of physical lives, or the attributes of the consciousness in the experiences of the soul in the attributes of physical consciousness. So he's saying one of the twins is, represents physical lives. An individual experience in the earth plane is motivated that by which arises from the sojourns in the influences of consciousness outside of the physical being, or as you would say, astrologically. So now he's saying one of the twins is also astrological influences. The sojourn in the environments and the environs of Venus, Jupiter, Mars, Neptune, Saturn, Uranus, Sun, Moon, the constellations of those effect on same, emotionally from the innate forces and by the emotional effects from the sojourns in the earth. So I know it's convoluted, but here what he's saying is that as it's coming up in the Revelation, you know, it's about, it's a, um, the, the book of Revelation, the way Casey interprets it, it's that it's a, it's a manual for spiritual awakening, spiritual development while we're in a physical form. He goes through the, the first half of the book is explaining our spiritual physical anatomy, and the second part of the book is going into um, the process of awakening, you know, the, the seals or the chakras and that sort of thing. And we'll take a break in, as soon as I finish this point, because I know it's getting, we've been here for an hour, the body starts to want to move. Um, so he says these twins, every, every person, as they're going through a spiritual awakening process, you have to come to terms with how much more there is than just this little physical life. And he says the two subconscious elements that are working with you are your past sojourns in the earth, and then your sojourns in these environs, which he calls our inter, uh, interplanetary sojourns that we do when we're in between lives. So those become our astrology. So our astrology is foundational in understanding, it, it influences who we are in a given life, as do our past life influences. So then when I read this, I was like, yes, I'm doing important biblical work. <laughs> and this is a reading where he just explains past lives and um, astrology. He basically is saying that um, your astrology is actually even more, it's in your um, individuality. So it's like in your skeleton. It's, it, it, that's why people don't have, you can't have a regression and you remember, you know, oh, I remember being in Mars, or I remember those sort of things. It's more when you do a regression, you remember more of the emotional elements which are related to your personality, which are from past lives. So we record past lives emotionally and mentally uh, we have our astrology. That's the way that they, they interface uh, with, the, uh, with the body. It's interesting to note though, that emotions are completely of being in a physical body. That when you're in a soul consciousness, you don't have fights, you don't slam doors, you're none of that. That's all part of the endocrine system. And that's part of a challenge that souls have with being in a physical body, is learning how to manage, manage emotional reality. But that's why when you're doing a regression, a lot of times the emotions connect. A lot of times we have emotions in this life that we don't quite understand where they come from. And it's from past lives that this can help uh, birth that. So that's, let me just finish the. And then another question number two. Explain the symbol of the death of the two, witness, two witnesses. So in that chapter, the two witnesses, astrology and past lives, they die. And then he says the answer. The master gave, before the world was, I am. Now if you abide in me and I in the Father, then I will bring to thy remembrance all things. So he's saying that you can tame, subdue these influences by remembering it. You know, if it's subconscious, it influences you. It's, it's part of your, your rubric. But if you bring it to consciousness, then it no longer lives so powerfully. You're able to incorporate it and make the, uh, the changes. Yet these are, are dead or only the consciousness that arises from same and that which is fanned into life or activity by the laws concerning same. So I'm not sure what he means by the laws, but I think that one of the laws is that we have access to all things. Most of us don't. You see, I think a lot of us, we don't claim our divine inheritance. Like I think most of us are begging and we don't realize that we're karmic millionaires. And to claim your inheritance, you have to do some work. You have to kind of awaken to, uh, to your, your spiritual legacy. 
<laughs> this is death by Casey reading. <laughs> I like to show some readings every now and then. You start appreciating people like me that try to help you interpret them. But I, you know, when I put him here, you know, his, the readings are convoluted. Sometimes they're ambiguous. So I'm giving you an interpretation. You may get another one, and it might be just as valid. You know, it's like I've read readings that at different stages in my development, they mean different things, or I pick up different things. That's one of the great things about working with the Search for God material. It communicates to you at the level of consciousness that you're reading it. Hence, they are dead but become alive again by remembrance. So a regression or a dream, you, you, you remember these things and then you have aha, and then you act consciously in this world rather than subconsciously. In what, uh, by the application of thought, in what the light of that which has been attained by the entity or soul that has applied the former lessons in thy experience. So the, you have a light if you can take what you've learned, you know, you've done all this work in your past lives. You've done so much. Why forget it? Like it's like, it's like applying for a job and you don't bring the resume that you have a fantastic resume. So many people, again, they have no, a, a regression can be very, very helpful when someone says, oh, I'd, I'd like to, you know, be more politically active, but who would listen to me? Oh well, yeah, you were Caesar. <laughs> you, were, you were his wife. You have total access to this stuff. And then you, you waken up, uh, you awaken to the possibility, and then you dare to be great. You know, that's what uh, is out there. And then uh, this will be a last slide, and then we'll take a break. So what are the uh, takeaways? On our path of spiritual awakening, uh, past lives and our astrological influences are foundational. And again, past lives are recorded emotionally. And so I think that uh, all of us here, you're all in your process, probably most of you have had a past life reading. I think a past life reading can be different than accessing it yourself. I encourage you to, to try it out. You don't have to buy a ticket from me or regressionist. You can, and when we do a session that, uh, later this morning, I'll invite you to do a meditation where you can access this personally and begin your own uh, exploration of your past lives. Now astrology, I think that that, I think it's helpful to have a good um, karmic or spiritual astrologer help you with that. I know that Ray Mathis, who's the astrologer that writes for the Venture Inward, she's very good, but I'm sure there's, there's many of them. And sometimes you might want to get a couple of you know, charts. One of the things that Edgar Casey never makes things simple. You know how he says you're supposed to cast a chart? From the moment the soul enters the body. And he says the soul doesn't necessarily enter the body at birth. And look at now, so many kids are born, they're being induced. He says that the, the moment of physical birth is a by chance element, but the astrology is pinpoint. The astrology is exact. You've been building that astrology a long time. And so he says sometimes the soul enters the body hours, days, or even weeks before or after because it's so precise. So there's a, a book by John Wilner where he helps you, in, it's like Edgar Cayce Astrological Influences. He helps you try to, he says you have to use the ascendant. The ascendant is your appearance. And so if you're, if your physical birth ascendant is Virgo, but you have much more of a Leo style to you, then you can kind of start to tinker with your uh, soul birth. Okay, let's take a break and 